Thanks, everybody. Yeah, so more crop, less weeds, more profit. That's, that's the game. And so I believe that narrow row spacing is one of those examples of non-herbicide weed control that gives us more profit and less weeds. So today I'm going to spend a bit of time making that argument and take you through a bit of a process. And at the end, you can tell me whether I've got it right and in which parts of the world I've got it a bit wrong. But that's where we come from, more profit, less weeds. There's a lot of things we can do for weeds that cost us a lot of money. Which are the ones that we can do which actually make us more money? All right, so let's start by naming the elephant in the room. <laughs> no, I'm not too old. It's quite funny, actually. I um, gave a presentation a couple of years ago at Ballarat, and I went over there, and I stood up, and I opened my presentation by saying, I should join a gym. I should do some workouts to keep the old body going so I can, uh, so I can keep doing all these sporting pursuits that I like doing. And I was making the comparison to farmers saying, I should tow a chaff cart, but I'm just not going to yet. Right? So guess what? I didn't join the gym. <laughs> right? And uh, I pushed the system till it broke. Right? And, uh, and I think that's actually what farmers do a lot. So following up from the Ballarat intro, yeah, I should have joined the gym and maybe I could have prevented it. I didn't, the system's broken, all right, let's move on from here. So we always talk about we beat farmers up, they're not acting fast enough. I think it's human nature, myself. All right, I was talking to Steve Powell's uh, a couple of weeks ago and we're talking about the good old days, you know. Hoe grass came out, 80s, you didn't need good crop agronomy. You could put a crop in, you could put it in low seeding rate, wide row spacing, you could put it in Early, late, didn't matter. Ryegrass came up, you spray hoe grass and it dies, okay? Didn't need good crop agronomy. Now we're in the days where we've obviously got resistant weeds. We need good crop agronomy. And this is the point I like to make today, is in this era of resistant weeds, we need things like our crop competition to be working for us. Jeez, I'm feeling very Ray Martin here. I should have my clipboard, shouldn't I? <laughs> but anyway, so... That's my point. We need good crop agronomy to manage resistant weeds, and we need to do it so we can make money. So I'm going to talk a bit about narrow row spacing and crop competition. I'd like to acknowledge that I work for ARI. I'm based at Plan Farm. I'm based in Geraldton. I contract most of my time to ARI to communicate ARI research. Uh, this bit of work here is a bit of Plan Farm research as well, and I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. But GRDC came to the party very quickly last year to, to put some funding up to do a trial, which I organised through Plan Farm. All right, so let's talk about crop competition. I always put Cadell up as our, as our uh, pin-up boy for crop competition. I think he's one of the great competitors of Australian sport. And, uh, and yeah, I think maybe we should call a wheat variety Cadell one day. But anyway, um, you crop competition, you get beautiful data like this, don't you? Have a look at that. Isn't that just absolutely the most remarkably beautiful bit of data you've ever seen? Dave Minky in the 90s. Seeding rate by row spacing. We're still talking about seeding rate and row spacing. But narrow row spacing, high seeding rate, less ryegrass seed set. It's a beautiful thing. There's another bit of that same sort of data. This is a trial of mine in 1999 when I was with elders. I uh, set this one up at a site we had. Same sort of thing, high seeding rates, narrow row spacing. We go further, another trial of mine from a couple of years ago when I was working for the Department of Ag and Food. Um, yeah, higher seeding rates, less ryegrass seed set. It's pretty straightforward, isn't it? Okay, the problem we have is this. We often do these seeding rate trials and we increase the seeding rate and we get no extra yield. So yes, higher seeding rates, they always give us more competition with weeds. But you're just getting more competition at a cost, aren't you? So for every 10 kilos, it costs you about four bucks, doesn't it? Because let's say we put the price of seed at at 400 bucks and there's, you know, because we've got grading and we've got storage and we've got to cart the stuff and, you know, there's, there's probably a cost, something like that is in there for seed. So there's a cost to increasing seeding rate for often no extra short-term yield gain. So last year I was in working with the farmer in Minganew, Stewie Smart. Uh, he, he works with these things. It's his stiletto boot there, the paired row sow sowing system. And he was asking the question, uh, can I make paired row sowing yield? If we've got paired row sowing on 12 inches, you know, can that yield something like six inch single seeding? You know, because we've got the same length of row in the paddock, haven't we? Uh, and so we set up a trial. Stewie uh, spoke to myself and GRDC, Darren Hughes and, and others at GRDC were very quick to react and, uh, and help out with some short term funding. Uh, Peter Horwood, local farmer in Minganew, 
was in his last paddock, he was hosting the Ming and Yu site, said, yeah, another trial site won't hurt. So he just said, yep, you can have a site. Uh, the whole thing came together in three days. I went to the Ag Department guys, they were awesome. So Steve Kosh and Larry Prosser and the crew, we spent two days in the drizzling rain under the cone seeder changing tines and row spacings to do, put in this trial. So it all came together very quickly, great team effort between Farmer, GRDC, Department of Ag and myself. Really good um, thing. So what we're trying to tease out is the difference between the seeding system. So we had single row sowing, paired row sowing and ribbon seeding by three seeding rates, 15, 22 and 30 centimetres by three rows, by, sorry, three row spacings, 15, 22, 30, three seeding rates. And a uh, couple of photos. So we're trying to look at this paired row system like this. Obviously, when we're paired row, it's, you know, it might be sort of three inch, nine inch, three inch, nine inch sort of thing. We don't think it can probably yield like narrow row spacing, but can it help, you know, can it help improve the yield of the wide rows? There's a couple of pictures of the trial, and that's the sort of thing that you see, obviously. It's, you don't have to be a rocket scientist to work out that in the wide rows, you've got a lot of daylight down here, haven't you? It was a weed-free site, mind you. We only, like I said, had a day to choose the site. Uh, and then, you know, your narrow row spacing, obviously a lot more competition, a lot more ground cover much more quickly. And there's just a closer up view of that sort of shading effect. And so let's have a look at the yield results. So this is a one-off trial, came together very quickly, so on 30th of May. And like I said, there's that embarrassing situation. Our higher seeding rates didn't give us any more yield. In fact, like some of the farmers say, as annoying as it is, perhaps that lower seeding rate was a bit higher yielding. I don't think that was significant, that result. But, you know, there's no difference in yield between the seeding rates. So you could increase your seeding rate to get competition. Going from 60 to 120 kilos, is going to cost, uh, what, $24 or something uh, for no extra yield. In terms of asking that question, can we separate out the single versus the ribbon versus the paired row sowing? No, we couldn't, we couldn't s split them out. They actually all yielded the same, even though there looks like there's some differences there. It was pretty noisy data, so there's no, no yield difference there. And so asking, we didn't manage to answer that question that Stewie Smart put up, can the paired row sowing uh, compensate and make up for the wide rows. So we didn't manage to answer that. What we did get was a predictable response to row spacing in some sense, in that the 15 centimetre row spacing out yielded the 30. I'm not exactly sure what happened with the 22 centimetre row spacing. I've got a feeling it might be to do with the way we harvested it. So with these trials you harvest the middle out of the plots uh, and so harvesting the 22 centimetre row spacing, it's possible the way we set up the header is what's responsible for that yield because there's nothing to indicate that that performed badly during the season. But anyway, the, the 15 to 30 was right in line with our normal row spacing response. So I'll tell you a bit more about that in a moment. So the thing that did really emerge out of it for me was this. And so this is a bit of a thing that I don't think we talk about much, but it's seeding efficiency. So Everything in farming is about efficiency these days. So how do you get the most of the seed that you plant to come up? So how do you maximise that percentage? So seeding efficiency, as I've called it, and that's just, I just made that term up, uh, is the percentage of seeds that you sow, how many of them come up? So we knew the germination percentage of the mace wheat that we sowed. We knew the seed size. We could calculate exactly how many seeds per metre squared we sowed, and then we could work out what percentage of them came up with our plant counts. And as you can see, the narrow row spacing, lower seeding rate, we're pretty close to 100% efficiency. Obviously, when you're at wide rows and a high seeding rate, you're trying to cram more into a row. It's competing with each other. I think perhaps our speaker in a couple of presentations time is going to talk about wheat allelopathic effects. I'm not exactly sure what drives it, but we're trying to cram so much seed into a metre of row that only 70% of it comes up. So this is about 70% emergence where we're at wide rows, high seeding rate, whereas when we're at the narrow rows, low seeding rate, nearly 100% of it's coming up. So this is the thing, efficiency. How do we maximise efficiency? Well, the most, the most efficient way to use your seed is at the narrowest possible row space and give each seed the most space so it can come up. That sound all right? So keep that in mind as we go. So there's a bit of a summary of that trial. It didn't sort of set out our objectives that we, um, that we set out, but we took a few farmer groups there and really got people talking about row spacing and seeding rate. Of all bloody things, we're still talking about row spacing and seeding rate. We've been doing this for how long? 
but farmers were still wanting to talk about, you know, row spacing and seeding rate. So I want to share with you, I'll just hold from putting that slide up, Glenn Reithmuller's data now. So uh, Glenn Reithmuller, in here somewhere, Glenn, yeah, there he is. He is a legend in my book, Reefer. 27 years he's had this trial going. Imagine putting in a row spacing trial for 27 years in a row. That's what he's done. And he's just given me the data to show you guys. That's pretty generous stuff, isn't it? So I think you might have already presented that or later on today. No? Oh, that's another one. Okay. So anyway, here's a bit of work from a 27 continuous year trial at Meriden. So he's got row spacings on the same plots each year, stubble retained, trifluralin pre, it's probably low ground and whatever in the 90s and so on. And this is the result that he got. This is back in 04 when it went in. He had a, like a Rytec collection system on the back of the plot harvester and he collected the ryegrass seed from the plots. And so by this stage, it's been going for what, uh, 17 years or so. Uh, and at that stage, after 17 years of, of putting the same row spacing on the same thing, there's a lot more ryegrass setting seed in the wide rows, as you can see. Now this next slide is just the most beautiful bit of data. Are you ready for it? Look at this, I'm just going to turn around with you and soak it up. <laughs> that's last year's result. So that's the ryegrass seed set in crop, 27 years in a row. Hand of applause for Glenn Reith Muller, ladies and gentlemen. <laughs> so, you know, if I could do this presentation with one slide, there it is. Look at that. Narrow row spacing, stubble retention, normal herbicides. Look at the result. It is just beautiful, isn't it? You can see my point. All right, so how do we make it work in a practical sense? Glenn Reith, mother, those trials are part of this book here. If you've got a, a client thinking about their next seeding bar, you must download this because I stand with the clients in, the, in front of this trial that we had last year, Darren, uh, the GRDC trial, and I would ask them, okay, what are the things that you weigh up when you're choosing the row spacing of your bar? And it's things like, oh, speed of sowing, trifluralin safety, um, you know, getting through the stubble, a uh, few other things, and I say to them, did any of you think about yield, right? <laughs> and the answer is no. They didn't look at the yield data when they were choosing their row spacing. Well, it's been done for you. These guys analysed 89 trials all around the country, and for all of that work, that's what they got. <laughs> Sorry, Reefer. You have to put in a trial for 27 years in a row so that I can sit up here and say 1% per inch. So for every inch that you increase your row spacing beyond 7 inches, you lose a percent of yield. And it's 89 trials. It's a pretty strong data set. Barley looks like it responds about the same, and with a limited number of trials, it looks like canola perhaps responds about the same as well, although that's a much smaller data set. So there's money to be made in that. Let's have a look at that. So if we compare to 12-inch row spacing, uh, what's the benefit? So the difference in centimetres is, you know, if going from 12 inch to 10 is 5 centimetres, and obviously going from 12 to 7.5 is 11. If we calculate the uh, yield benefit out from that 1% per inch, and if we're looking at a 2 tonne per hectare crop, that's how much money there is to be made, okay? But of course there's a cost. So let's take a look at the cost. So I called up a machinery dealer, and, uh, and there's a the cost. It's the cost of the bar is a cost. So for a John Deere bar, it was an extra $13,000 to buy it at 10 inches or $24,000 to buy it at 7.5. A more expensive bar, like a DBS or something, that's probably going to be greater. These are easy figures you can do. And the back of the matchbox calculation tells you that if you, know, you keep that bar for eight years, a couple of thousand hectares, it's around, you know, it's a dollar, dollar fifty a hectare. That cost of the bar that is often quoted as a problem, as a barrier, it's around, you're paying a dollar a hectare for that, dollar fifty. You've got extra fuel, and so uh, this is worst case scenario. I've calculated this fuel, so I've just multiplied the number of tines out. It doesn't actually work like that. So if you have twice as many tines, you don't use twice as much fuel. But that's the way I've calculated this, just because I couldn't find the accurate calculator. So worst case scenario is there's a few dollars of extra fuel. Uh, there's a delayed sowing cost. So a grower I spoke to up there said that he could tow 12 inches and 10-inch bar at the same speed at his 10.5 k's an hour. 
He slowed down to 10 k's an hour when he went to seven and a half inches. Uh, and then if you calculate that out by the, the yield loss per day of 35 kilograms per hectare per day, we've got a, a cost of time of sowing because the narrow row spacing bar is a tiny bit slower. Uh, so there's your cost, and that's a worst case scenario cost, right? So if we go to the scoreboard, two ton crop, you know, there's money to be made in narrow row spacing. And if you go to a four ton crop, the higher the yield, the more you've got to lose from wide row spacing, right? So there's money to be made from narrow row spacing. So I'll tell you a story about a guy that's doing it, Steve Brindle up our way, Minganyu, he's a high rainfall grower, he's 5,200 hectares of crop, him and one workman put the whole thing in together, he tows two chaff carts, that's not actually his header but he's got a very similar setup to that uh, behind his system, it's the classic thing of, of taking over from the old man, got rid of all the livestock, went to the complete continuous crop on a bigger scale, uh, so he can't afford any compromise in his efficiency. There's his bar, he bought a John Deere bar, uh, set it up at seven and a half inch row spacing. He'd seen the neighbours doing it at seven and a half inch row spacing. He ribbon seeds through this, that's a modified stiletto boot, so cut the back out of the stiletto boot, it sows about a two inch band of seed. So this guy's actually achieving five inch row spacing. You just would not think five inch row spacing is possible, would you? Because he's at seven and a half and he's, and he's spanning at two inches, right? So he's achieving a very narrow row spacing in a high rainfall zone. Uh, and like I said, efficiency is a big thing for him. There's him and his workmen sow the crop. So he's on the cedar, his workman spraying, calls him up, says, I'm running out of seed. The workman drives the boom spray there, chases the tractor, fills it in 12 minutes and they keep going, you know, and then he goes back spraying. So, you know, they just could not afford any efficiency to go back to this seven and a half inch row spacing. And, it, you know, he left the soil like a beautiful sheet of corduroy. End result was 3.6 tonnes per hectare, which is the highest yielding average uh, that I heard of in our district last year. There might be one or two close to it, but brilliant, brilliant effort in his first year of a seven inch bar. So I'm putting that up to show that it's possible. Not everybody can get to seven inches if you're in four and five ton per hectare country. Seven inches probably isn't possible, but 10 is because this new gear can do it and you've got these big headers that can gobble up a heap of straw and they can cut it off very, very low. So when we're talking stubble handling with this gear, the new gear can handle a lot more stubble than the gear of a decade ago, which is the one you're replacing now. There's another factor that is another option for increasing your crop competition with weeds, and that is crop row orientation. So Catherine Borges down here, Catherine did six trials. Those six trials average 50% reduction in ryegrass seed set uh, through crop row orientation. So if you look at it, here's how it works here. Uh, when you sow east-west in winter, uh, there's obviously the sun is low in, on the horizon and it shades the weeds in the interrow. When you say north-south, there's a lot more light for the weeds. Catherine's here, she can answer questions about this later. But, you know, people say, look, I've seen bits where I've got a headland this way and rows that way, and uh, I haven't seen anything. Guess what? Neither did she. She didn't see any biomass difference between these, but when she went and measured the ryegrass seed set, there was a big reduction in seed set. So it's possible that row spacing, narrow row spacing could make you money and give you competition with weeds. And for paddocks that suit it, east-west sowing can give you weed control for free to bring, to give you extra crop competition. So I've just put Weed Smart up there. Um, there's, I'm going to load this information, this sort of argument that I'm making onto the Weed Smart website by the end of the week, probably. That point two there, the capture weed seeds at harvest, that's been populated very well. I've got a lot of information there about all the harvest weed seed control techniques. The, uh, the crop competition bit will populate shortly. So keep an eye on that for a good place to go to to get a summary of, of what I'm presenting today. Uh, Ari Insight is a, is a regular newsletter we put out with Ari. Might, many of you are already subscribing to it, but it's really just a summary of the latest research. You might pick that in your agenda. There's a big announcement from Ari tomorrow. There's going to be a big Ari Insight on Wednesday that tells you more about that. So um, get in and subscribe. I'll leave the subscribe details. The other way of getting Ari Insight is to follow me on Twitter and I, will, I retweet it every week so that um, that's the other way you can get it. All right, so to finish up, so I've put an argument there that to, to get weed control in this era of herbicide resistance, we need our non-herbicide tools. We need the non-herbicide tools that make money 
make more crop and less weeds and more profit. I've put to you that there's a good argument there, I think, that we can do that through narrow row spacing and possibly crop row orientation. Our first go-to point is normally just upping the seeding rate, uh, which works, don't get me wrong, high seeding rates works for competition, but it often comes as a cost with no yield response. What I'm obviously saying is that at narrow row spacing, I think we can make more money and compete with the weeds. So my final statement is the agronomists and, and so on in the room, we've had an awesome era. We've had the herbicide era. It's been awesome. It's drawing to close. Herbicides are not all finished, but we think the new era is the diversity era. So that means that we need to use herbicides in combination with all these other things. You know I've been banging on about it for years. But my point is, is that we've got these non-herbicide tools. You guys know your herbicides really, really well. You need to get to know your non-herbicide tools as well as you know your herbicide tools. Thank you. Pete, uh, thanks. Uh, love the message as usual. Just got uh, one issue with the. By default, you're selling effectively the uh, benefits of paired rows or wider systems that in the low rainfall zone, stiletto points are stacked in the scrap heap. Uh, as the Harrington split were in the 90s when they had a crack, and the Morris have got a system out there as well, is that gravity being a constant in life, water goes to the bottom of the furrow. And if you've got seeds in that dry band, which these systems have got, these things don't come out of the ground. Mm -hmm. um, if last couple of years we've been lucky enough to put the crop in with a stick because it's been moist, but um, in 010, these type of boots cost growers a lot of money. And I just, I like, I like the message. I just think that there's, there's issues when you start going with, with a lot of dry seeding and it's dry all the time. Uh, that's a good point, Brownie, and thanks for that. Now, if you think that I've sat here and said that I think the future is paired row sowing, then I've sort of blown it a bit because I think the future is narrow row spacing. And as I said, with that trial, we couldn't tease out a difference in yield between paired row and single. It might be there, but in that trial, we didn't get it, right? So I'm only talking about a small percentage. And so, no, I'm not saying the future is just paired row. I think the future is, is narrower time spacing, is the way to get the competition. Um, and yes, you're right, the guys in our part of the world have seen similar things with the stiletto where in certain conditions you can poke the seed under the non-wetting um, sand in the furrow wall. The guys that are having less problems with that have got the big five-inch pneumatic press wheel and they're having less issues. But Steve Brindle's one there with the, with the back cut out of it was to make a ribbon and his point was exactly that. He'd, he'd had stilettos and he was a bit worried he was poking too much under the and the ridge and he wasn't getting as good establishment, which is why he went the, more the ribbon rather than the pear. So no, I, I agree with you. I, I think you've got to use whichever, whichever system works, whichever point or works. My point is, is that, uh, that the narrower the row spacing, the more money you'll make and the more competition you have with weeds. Hello, Jeff Fosbury. Um, just uh, everything in life is never black and white. It's all Shades of Grey, which are one of my trainers, taught me to learn very quickly. In Steve Brindle's situation, uh, looking at going to seven inch rows, what sort of rates of trifluralin did he get up to to handle the, or did he have that uh, to handle the uh, ryegrass that was there, or did he have such low levels of ryegrass with his chaff carts and so on that he did he use any trifluralin? Did he, what, what did he use? Yeah, no, he used trifluralin, Steve Brindle. He's got plenty of ryegrass, so he's only in his second year of chaff cart, so he probably needs several years of this system working together to get that seed bank down. So, no, he's got his fair share of uh, weed numbers in some parts of the farm, uh, and he's safely using good, sturdy rates of trifluralin. I'm not going to say the exact rate, but I know that it's up there with the 1.6, 1.8 thereabouts, but I, I don't know specifically. His neighbours uh, are on seven inches with just a, a single point, the, the Prestons, uh, Tomos here, they go flat out, don't they, with seven inches, 13 k's an hour, don't they, with plenty of trifluralin, is that, um, is that right? Yeah. And so it is, it is possible, uh, and the way Steve worked it out was he uh, just tried a couple of, couple of boots the year beforehand, made sure that he had the safety, and then just... A, extreme attention to detail in that first seeding to make sure he wasn't poking the seed in the trifluralin band. So, yeah. So, no, he's using plenty of trifluralin, same as everybody else, 
uh, just um, narrow rows. Yeah. Uh, Andrew Heinrich from Esperance. So Peter, um, and you haven't mentioned anything about discs. And we've got quite a few guys down our way that, that use discs. And, and yeah, and obviously uh, you can, can look at different row spacings and handle stubble in different ways as well with, with discs versus tines. Yeah, look, um, I don't want to... I'm just going to assume that the row spacing effect between discs and tines is the same, but I don't know that for a fact. And I don't know if anyone else in the room can help me. Um, I know down your way, Mick Fells. I don't know if Mick's in the room, is he? I spoke to Mick um, last year, and Mick, Mick moved to a disc system, and, and he said he set it up on seven inches because he just couldn't find any data to convince him that uh, otherwise that, you know. And with the disc seeders, often you can buy them in that single rank, can't you, at about 15 inches, and, and they're much, much cheaper, and there's a real temptation to buy the cheaper machine with this single rank. It's much simpler and go to wide rows and then sort of convince yourself somehow that you've done the right thing. And, uh, and you know, I think, uh, you know, there are systems that... So the thing is, I think those guys that go wide rows discs or what very wide rows tines, they definitely lose some yield from row spacing. I, I just don't think you can dispute 89 trials. But what those guys then turn around and often say is, look, I know I've lost some yield with the row spacing, I'm, I, but I'm making it up otherwise. So I might be making it up through seeding faster, or uh, I might be fully matched tram line, reducing compaction, full stubble retention, and all of that. Yep, so I think that in some situations, a good example up our way is Brady Green. He's on 15 inch rows with stilettos going flat out so that he can get his 12 metre machine to do seeding fast enough. So, but I think he would turn around and say, yeah, I think I know that I'm losing a bit of yield through my row spacing, but it, it's, it's working, making my whole system work. So that's fine, but the, the fact remains that it doesn't matter whether we're a disc or a tine, if we're on 14 or 15 inch rows, we've just got no competition with weeds. It's as simple as that. Yeah, look, I don't think it works for every seeder. So you're referring to a DBS, I suppose. Is there others? I don't know, but uh, yeah. And look, it, it may, not, may not work for every seeder, as simple as that. But all I would say, and I don't, I'm not obsessed with everyone getting to seven inches. But all I say to guys is do your sums when you set it up and just go to the narrowest practical row spacing. So I don't know what row spacing DBS has come at, but do they work at 10 inches? And if so, then yes, but you might not get it to work at seven. But there's always a temptation, especially with an expensive seeder like that, to set it up at 12 or 14 inches to save money on that capital purchase, isn't there? And as I think that that's just, uh, I think it's just a bit short-sighted.